here for the first time is a look inside Canada's top secret $20 million atomic research plant at Chalk River, Ontario. Not until now have the strict regulations surrounding atomic development permitted any of its work to be shown. Casual visitors are still not welcome at Chalk River. Outsiders and workers are carefully investigated, fingerprinted, sworn to secrecy. Everyone must wear a pass bearing his photograph, be checked in and out, not only at the gate, but at the buildings inside the grounds. Shielded by hundreds of tons of lead and concrete is the atomic pile, a controlled, slow-motion atomic explosion, out of which come the strange new elements and radioactive isotopes that are the materials of atomic researchers. To a storage room with walls two feet thick and lead-lined bins, tiny particles of radioactive materials weighing a millionth part of a pound are carried, shielded in 500-pound lead flasks. Signs warn workers that they can remain only a few minutes without danger from radiation. Nearly everything is handled by remote control. Really dangerous substances are removed from this flask by machinery, but the mildly active isotope contained in the capsule inside this aluminum ball can safely be handled with tongs and shipped in a 35-pound steel case. Shipments from Chalk River open new horizons of knowledge to hospitals and laboratories. For example, radioactive phosphorus used in fertilizer can be traced by its radiations. Tell a researcher what proportion of the phosphorus in a plant came from the fertilizer. A chemist's bench becomes a strange contrivance in a radioactive lab. A wall of lead bricks separates him from his apparatus. He works by remote control. Air is drawn away from him by an exhaust system to prevent contamination by alpha particles. In a really hot lab, almost everything is automatic. Processes are watched through mirrors. Radiation in the room is checked constantly. Workers remain only for short periods. Ever since early atom smashers found they had made a new element never found in nature, plutonium's chemistry has been a major study. In a tiny electric furnace, plutonium from the pile is purified for further experiment. An elaborate system of pumps, glass tubes and controls creates a very high vacuum in the furnace. In the intense, low-pressure heat, impurities are burned off leaving inside the inmost crucible an almost microscopic quantity of pure plutonium metal. A whole new technique, almost a new science, has had to be devised for working with radioactive materials. Because of the dangers of radiation, quantities must be kept infinitesimally small. By the standards of microchemistry, an object which can be seen without a microscope is enormous. Instruments are minute. Quantities are measured in thousands of a gram. Scientists at Chalk River have had to invent and build much of their own apparatus, like this microbalance, which will weigh as little as one ten millionth of a gram. Its action depends on the torsion of pure quartz thread spun finer than a spider web. Radioactive contamination is silent and deadly. A special health crew checks workers constantly. Each worker checks himself before leaving the plant. Everything picks up the insidious radiations. A lab dish which has itself become active will spoil experiments, may even be dangerous. When the Geiger counter shows an instrument to be contaminated, it must be thrown into the hot disposal barrel. Even the paint on the walls is stripped every few months. Sometimes, even buildings must be torn down and discarded. Wearing protective respirators, waste men gather all discarded material, bury it in huge isolated dumps. Much of it may be dug up and used again six months to three years hence. Disposal of radioactive waste is a serious problem. Nothing quenches radioactivity, not burning, nor throwing in the sea, nor burying in the ground. Only time. Before we can go far in the atomic age, we must find a way to rid ourselves of its deadly weight. At Ottawa, the Honorable James McKinnon, Minister of Trade and Commerce, is welcomed home after making a 25,000-mile tour 
of 11 countries to promote Canada's foreign trade. To reporters, he gave the keynote of the mission. Trade is a two-way street, he said. If we are to sell, we must buy. This attitude was stressed in South Africa, the main objective of the mission, both by Mr. McKinnon and the seven businessmen who accompanied him. Greeted by Prime Minister Smuts at his home, the mission began at once its survey of industries and markets. Near Johannesburg, the unique Clip River plant turns coal, mined on the spot, into electric power. Part of the same government-sponsored development is the Vecor Steelworks, largest in the Dominion. South Africa is anxious for branch plants of Canadian industries, offers many advantages, like the complete city are now under construction to house workers in the steel and power plants. Houses built by production line methods will provide every modern convenience for 125,000 people. South Africa's housing problem is, if anything, more acute than our own. In sharp contrast is the manor house at Groot Drakenstein, built in 1712. The manor is now an experimental fruit farm, and from its vineyards come wines well thought of in Canada. At luncheon, Mr. McKinnon emphasized that the Canadian trade mission came to buy as well as sell. Pointed out that Canada is the first country to set up a special department to help foreign exporters find markets within the country. No government pacts were attempted, arrangements were left to businessmen of the two nations. South Africa is the world's greatest gold producer. Her refinery ladles provide ready dollars to pay for imports, yet she can sell in sterling. A good customer both ways for Canada. Next to gold, South Africa is famous for diamonds. Near the modern Wesselton workings is Kimberley's abandoned big hole where Cecil Rhodes began. It was dug by hand 1,700 feet deep. Native laborers work on half to one year contracts, live in company compounds, line up for payday like an army and on holidays they dance, dance until they collapse. Next day, the company hospital is full. <laughs>